Okay, so I have two o'clock on my time. So I will just basically give you a couple pointers here. Um, so I am Skylar with Lean Frontiers. As you can see, we do have Oscar back with us and he is going to update us on the Warburn Estate Winery. Um, if you do have a question, just insert it into the chat feature. I will be back here behind the scenes monitoring the questions. And um, I will also, just a heads up, when you submit me a question, I will interrupt Oscar. So don't think I'm just out here being rude, interrupting him. <laughs> um, but for that, um, just make sure you use the chat feature. Also, this will have a recording sent out 24 to 48 hours. Um, so if you're interested in that, just remember it will be sent out 24 to 48 hours. With that, I will hand it over to Oscar. Thanks, Kyla, and thanks again to you for your organisation. I know you do a lot of work behind the scenes, which people watching don't realise, and, and I probably don't realise, so appreciate it. And thanks for those who have joined us live. Uh, again, appreciate that you've given us, uh, given me half an hour of your time. I'm just going to share my screen and start the PowerPoint. <clears throat> so a couple of pointers on this. The title is What's Happening with Standardisation at Warburn Estate Winery. In 2019, we are, the group that you can see there attended at a week with Mr. Asayo Kato in Japan, 2019. And in uh, this uh, particular webinar is about what's happening now at Warburn Estate with applying what we learnt through Mr. Kato. And it's particular focus on the work that Peter, Josh and Lisa have done. Peter and Josh, or are doing, sorry. Peter and Josh are supervisors, Lisa is the production manager uh, in the packaging section of Warburn Estate. So as, Lee, as uh, Skylar said, uh, I've got a, some questions that were submitted that I'm going to talk about or answer in about 15 to 20 minutes because the body of this will take about 15 to 20 minutes. But if you have questions relative to what I'm talking about um, uh, during this 15 or 20 minutes, please um, submit them and Skylar will interrupt me. Uh, just one thing right off the bat is Alvaro Gali has said is is a standard in when he registered I said is a standardized model for any type of companies the answer is yes <clears throat> so please if you, even if you're not from manufacturing consider the content of this and the reason for that is that what we what I really picked up from Mr Cato was a set of philosophies and principles through the step up model rather than a concrete pathway you must do this you must do that you must use this form, you must use that form uh, right now. It was more about the principles and philosophies that sit in behind these tools that we see everywhere. So if you consider the principles and philosophies that are embedded within it, then yes, the model for standardization can be applied to any organization, any industry, anywhere. I'm completely confident of that. In fact, we're working with a, um, a, a disability carer at the moment and although we haven't started on that I'm encouraging them to give it a to give it a crack and the reason for that is I can see how the, uh, the philosophies and principles of this model can work can apply there um, so let's get started as I said this is about what's happening now at Warburn Estate and there's another sorry another prerequisite point is that there's an assumption in what I'm about to go through is that you've seen previous webinars I've done on this step-up model. So I'm not going to explain the model in detail or explain the step-up. So I'm going to skim through that very quickly. So there is an assumption that you're already familiar with the model. <coughs> Pardon me. If you're not, Lean Frontiers has recordings of previous webinars. You can jump on that and have a look. So the first important thing in the model is that every organisation has work going on at their frontline level. It doesn't matter who you are service manufacturing, whatever it may be, you have work going on at the frontline level. With the step-up model, the first thing we do is we, we establish work standards and in uh, for that work. And in those work standards, the primary drive, just to keep it simple, the primary aim is to make normal very clear. Once we've made normal very clear in the work that's being done, normal, so we can make a normal abnormal judgment. Once we've made that very clear, we build adherence to work standards through training and whatever else, uh, whether, what other uh, tools we can bring along, and we problem solve abnormal. So that is the activity within those two activities. Essentially, we're <clears throat> going through the process of standardization uh, using a PDCA type pattern. And if we do that for long enough, 
And remember this model that we've illustrated in Toyota, we're at this for about 30 years. Um, we've got to get obviously a lot quicker at it than that. But through that model of standardization, uh, we will end up with efficient standardized work, which means production attacked, work sequenced precisely, and uh, just enough work. So that very briefly is the model. We could spend an hour on this model um, to go into more detail, but we won't do that. The five step ups we have step up one, two, and three are really about bringing about stability in the work. Uh, once you're at the step up three level, you've really got stability within the work. In other words, this is our required performance, then our actual performance is on a par with our required performance. Beyond that stability area, if you like, step up three, we have step up four, step up five, which is what I would prefer to term genuine continuous improvement. In other words, here's our expected performance level at the stability point, we're going to raise the bar and increase our expectations of our performance level or how, how we perform. To me, that's genuine CI. Uh, when we drop below the required standard and return, that's not genuine CI in my world, uh, and, and as far as I'm concerned, that's returning things back to where they should be. Genuine CI is when we take our uh, consistent standard performance and raise the bar. So step up four and five is really about that. The good news, uh, while we're in Japan, Mr. Kato said, not every organization can and needs to get to step up five, but substantial benefit will be gained by adopting the philosophies of standardization to take you as far as is commercially needed. It was terrific when he said that, I've repeated that in other webinars. And the reason for that is because, um, and including our business, <coughs> um, uh, Ben and my business, and uh, most of the organizations we work with, they're mostly around the step up two, step up three level. I haven't had any very limited exposure to anyone who's beyond that. So it was, uh, so it was very good news to see, to see that, even to the point where Mr. Cato said that there's not many Toyota plants that are at the step up five level. Step up one work standards, as I've alluded to at the start, step up one is about taking, making normal, uh, normal, is getting normal to be communicated very, very clearly, or sorry, establishing a very clear boundaries for normal abnormal. So we start with our output standard. In other words, we look at the operation or the process of the machine, we consider the output of the machine and we establish the quality parameters for normal for that output. And that's this first brick, if you like. Then we say, well, in the, the process that's producing this output, whether it be a machine or a person or whatever it may be, what are the standard settings that we require? What's normal for those standard settings to produce normal in the output? And then if that was a machine, we look at the person and say, well, what's the person need to do to establish normal, uh, the normal settings in the machine, our hypothesis being that we're going to produce normal in the output. So with work standards, we develop them from left to right, starting with the output of the process of the machine. Remembering that all the way through, our primary driver is to make normal very clear. Work standards are not a basis for finding fault. Once we have them, they're not a basis for finding fault. They are a basis for comparison. So we can have our work standard and say, here's our work standard, here's what's actually happening. Do we have a normal or abnormal situation? That's the purpose of work standards. <clears throat> and John Shulk has quoted Mr. Cato uh, as saying the following, before you can begin with standardized work, you must clarify your work standards. Now, you know, I, when I come back, I saw that statement in uh, about December 2019. <clears throat> and I didn't, I sort of thought, well, that probably makes sense. It's now only through going through the work at Warburton Estate and five or six other organizations uh, that I truly understand that statement and see why he said it. Once work standards are established and normal is made very clear, I wouldn't say the rest just falls into the place. It's clearly it's not as simple as that, but the rest that you need to do in the standardization journey becomes so much more simpler. And why? One of the reasons why that is the case, because if you don't, uh, this was in the Lean Thinker, I picked it up at the same time as that other statement, 2019. It says, if you don't have it, or it, uh, it, quoted, it was quoted as saying, if you don't have a clear expectation of what good looks like, then your definition of not good is subjective and varies depending on who, what, and when things are being looked at. Now, people are saying, well, what's the problem with that? Well, here's the problem. 
building adherence to work standards and problem solving abnormal becomes much harder because you first got to sort through the good, not good opinions. It becomes harder because if you don't have a clear, uh, uh, you haven't established clearly your what's normal, so you can make a normal abnormal judgment, you first got to thought, sort through people's opinions. And what ends up, the, the classic is you know, shift A, shift B. Shift A has one standard for normal in the output and they will set the machine accordingly. Shift B comes in and says, well, what's shift, what's shift A doing? Shift A have got this machine set this way, why? They're all wrong and they go and adjust the machine. And we've got all these machine adjustments happening or process adjustments happening because the interpretation of normal for the output is not consistent across all people who are involved in it. The classic situation, not only in manufacturing, you see it in, in service as well. Uh, Opinion-based assessment of set points or process conditions based on an opinion of what the output should look like. That is what we're trying to get away from. So if you do have a clear expectation of what good looks like, then your definition of not good is objective and the same, no matter what and when things are being looked at. Now, this makes building adherence to work standards and problem solving abnormal a whole heap easier because there's no sorting through good and not good opinions right at the start. So step up two, step up three, <clears throat> have a solid foundation of normal abnormal. So therefore, when we are doing the activities within those two, building adherence to work standards and the problem solving and abnormal and the other things that go in there, the, um, the, those activities become much simpler. And uh, thanks, Patrick, for alerting me to this. Patrick Draup, in the material uh, that, that we're developing <clears throat> for um, uh, to really put into a, a, a course for what we learnt in 2019 at a higher level than this, he's, uh, Mr. Co Mr. Cato said this, the purpose of work standards is to create a basis of efficient production that delivers the quality our customers require. So the key words is they create a basis. Without work standards, you won't create efficient production that delivers the quality our customers require. The work standards create a basis. So I probably should have highlighted that, is that the key words there is create a basis of efficient production that delivers the quality our customers require. So um, I've talked about step up one of the five step ups is about establishing our work standards. The key point, the key issue there being the determination of normal, abnormal, key driver all the time. In step up two, there's various things here, balancing work to tack uh, started, work sequencing started, you, can you guys can read. The ones that I'm going to focus on, the two I'm gonna focus on are the two in bold in this discussion is the heavy emphasis on training to the work standard starts to happen in step up two and means by which rapid determination of normal abnormal is being developed in uh, step up two. So they're the, my points of focus for these illustrations coming from Warburn. Just a point, um, and it ties in with what Alvaro asked, service providers can use the philosophies and principles of the step-up model. Uh, what may happen with service providers is, is less emphasis on the machine settings that are the middle block represented by the middle block, but we're still asking the same question. What are the elements of the service that satisfy the customer, capture normal for each? What are the elements of the person's action that impact normal in the service, capture normal for each? So the philosophies and principles at step up one certainly apply to anything, manufacturing, service, healthcare, whatever, doesn't matter. All right, so let's have a look at um, the Warburn estate. And the first line we're gonna look at is the cast line. And we have uh, Josh here up top right. Josh is the supervisor. He's been the, the, doing most of the lead work. I've started off by doing a reasonable amount with him. <clears throat> and as time has gone on, I've gradually let go. And he's picked up the skills of doing step up one, step up two. And by the way, Josh and Lisa and Peter and other supervisors and team leaders at Warman Estate have all been trained in JI and JR, job instruction and job relations. They've all been trained and are skilled in job instruction and job relations. It's an important point. So the Jetpack, uh, that machine you see there takes a cast like this in on the near side in that picture, brings it in on the near side, it wraps plastic around it, top and bottom from those rolls, puts it through a heat tunnel and out the other end comes a unit of two or a unit of four wrapped in plastic so it's quite rigid. So the, and that means that A, the customer can pick it up off the pallet, but also the robot can pick it up. 
So Josh went through the process, the exercise of step up one. That's not this conversation. I've shown that in previous webinars. The interesting thing about that was what we determined was that one of the one of the one of the causes when we were problem solving of of getting to abnormal settings is they were set normal, they would go abnormal. Was the way this role was being put on the machine. So when that role was being put on the machine, particularly by short people, it was almost being thrown up there. That was throwing settings in the machine out. What that indicated very quickly was that we needed, or Josh needed, <clears throat> my job instruction breakdown to about how to load the plastic roll. So there's the job instruction breakdown that he developed for loading the plastic roll. Now, the interesting thing about this was, this is the key point of the, all the key points. Um, when we put it onto the new rollers, we use the side roller all the way and we put it up gently. So when this was the key point of the key points and made a lot of difference to the, the, to the frequencies of abnormals uh, settings for the machine once we got going. It was a very interesting exercise. So my point there is that establishing normal and problem solving abnormal caused the need for good instruction to just appear. It just got pulled in rather than launch out over the training program, once we've established normal and started to problem solve abnormal, it just got pulled in. The need for job instruction just got pulled in. Um, here's an example of rapid determination of normal and abnormal being developed. <clears throat> There's a number of, um, the machine standards have a number of measures, uh, a lot of measures in the, in the, well, not that, for this machine is probably 12 or so set points that require measurement. So rather than have the operator measure from the perspex door here, to that slider, that perspex slider you can see, Josh has developed a number of these bars or visual tools <clears throat> that the operator can use to gauge whether that plastic, uh, whether that perspex uh, endpoint is in the right place. And you can see that there's a tolerance there. The, the width of that green area is the tolerance for the, for the operator, as long as that Perspex shield is anywhere in that green area, the right-hand corner. Then it's in. Then it is normal. If it's in red or beyond, it's abnormal. Now Josh, you can see there's four or five, four or five bars on the machine, uh, or four sitting there that they use on the machine. That's not all of them. The operators have about seven at their disposal, and they're all. You can't see it, but they're engraved. The name of where to use it is engraved in there. So um, someone, one of the uh, Mari Little, who's joined us submitted a question, do you use visual aids in your training? So Mari, there's a good um, example of visual aids being used in the training, I'm just crossing the questions out as I cover them. So there's a really good example of the use of visual aids in training, it gets pulled in in step up two. <clears throat> How do we uh, rapidly determine or communicate normal abnormal? Because for an operator to get out their tape measure and measure it um, is arduous. And the reality is at three in the morning, I'll bet it wouldn't happen there's a much greater chance of this happening at three o'clock in the morning when no supervisors are around and they're on night shift. So what did Josh do? He's largely, he has finished his work on the jetpack. He's gone upstream. So he's gone upstream to the bag in box and then the filler. And he's applying um, the same, pr same pattern, working from left to right with our work standards, to make normal very clear. So the bag in box is the bags fall down this chute, go into the box. The box moves along to the left, as you can see from our point of view. The, end, the bottom and the top gets uh, glued and clamped and uh, pressed shut, and then the box tips out. So essentially what you have coming out of the um, bag and box is this unit. This then goes to the jetpack. <clears throat> the filler itself, up here you have a filling line, goes into an empty bag, the bags are joined when they get filled, the bags get filled, they roll down by gravity towards the chute. There's a cutter that separates the bags at the perforation, and then the bags fall into the bag and box. So this is Josh's focus there. Now, an interesting thing, really interesting thing that happened in terms of the machine, uh, the, the machine work standard was defining normal for clean. It was critical and was a real challenge. So the, the filling head has to be clean. But when we got onto that, it was, it, it was really interesting because there was a, a multiple definitions of green or multiple interpretations of what was really meant by clean. So we had that red poster situation where it was, a, it was um, subjective, that assessment of clean, that was causing quite a bit of drama. But once that was defined, again, the need for good instruction just appeared. Whoops, sorry. 
the need for good instruction just appeared. And Josh is now working on three job instruction breakdowns. He's drafted them. He's, uh, they're just going for QA to be put on the system. Um, the, the, uh, the job instruction breakdowns describe the three cleaning tasks to achieve, to achieve the clean standard. So it was a really, it was a great, a great example of how defining normal pulled the need for good instruction. Defining clean pulled the need for three job instruction breakdowns on how to clean a machine. All right, so let's have a look at what Lisa is doing. Lisa's working on the glass line screw capper. Um, work standard, first of all, for the screw capper. Really interesting how um, defining normal for the screw cap became a real challenge. How do we get from the green, red to the green situation? And uh, for example, here's the work standard. So the redraw, how do we define normal for that? The thread, how do we define normal for that? The knurling, how do we define normal for that? There was, there was definitions beforehand, but the definitions varied from operator to operator to some degree. This is a really important part of the bottle of wine. So to get everyone on the same page with the exact standards was, it was critical. And then what that drew out, at least it's just getting to the step up two point, was a heavy emphasis on training because when you set the screw cap a height, putting this bottle in the right place so it aligns with uh, screw cap ahead three, which is what they used to set it, uh, set the height, was really important. And the operators were putting the, were setting it to the wrong, um, wrong screw cap ahead. So Lisa developed a job instruction breakdown for simply putting the bottle in the right place. That was critical. The need for good instruction just appeared. Peter is working on the glass line. He's on the carton erector. So, the, and what I should point out that Lisa and Peter are a fair bit behind Josh in building their skills. So we've picked these two machines as their, um, as their machines to uh, learn by doing on, if you like. So screw, uh, the carton erector erects the, erects the cartons from a bank of cartons, forms them into the right shape, and then glues the bottom. This is what comes out the other end. Now, interesting point again with the work standard. One of the things Peter said to me was that the carton has to be square. And as soon as he said it, I thought, ah, interpretation of square. I mean, that's, that's, that box is not square if you're going to be technical about it, looking about it from above. But it, what Peter said to me, it's square enough. So are we all going to make the same judgment on that? No, some operators may judge that not to be square and start fiddling with the machine. So what was really interesting through this and trying to get to the green poster situation was that what we learned was, <coughs> I mean, what we learned was that what actually determined square was the glue with the bottom flaps, the way they were glued at the bottom. So if they were glued in the right position at the bottom of the box, and we had normal at the bottom of the box, then the top of the box was just square. So what we actually learned was we needed to focus on the glue, the flat positions and the gluing at the bottom of the box. And here are our normal abnormal, here are our normals. Once we focused on that, then square just happened, if you like. And job instruction was also pulled in with the position of that little pin because there was debate as to how far down that, um, uh, sorry, 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 sorry. Peter uh, hasn't got to that stage. In terms of the machine standard, there was debate about how far down that pin needs to be to stop other all the boxes just falling out rather than one by one. So the work standard that you see here focuses on um, one of the elements of the work standard. It opens. One of the elements of the work, fo work standard focuses on how far that pin should be below the top of the box. So that's taken five minutes longer than I anticipated. So just to quickly run through some of the questions, I've covered two of them. Um, Beth Carlson, you said, you asked, what steps did you take to gain your team's buy into this change? Well, one of the things that's important is I'm a huge believer in job relations. Um, so really essentially what we've done throughout is apply the foundations of job relations and Peter and Lisa and Josh are uh, trained in found job relations. So I've been, uh, been encouraging them and we've been practicing the application of job relations. So one of the foundations is tell people in advance about changes, changes that will affect them. So we've let the operators know that this is the, that we're starting to work on this bit of a, on this aspect. 
the outcome of this is going to be more training. So there's an example of that. One of the foundations, sub foundations is figure out what you expect of the person. I mean, really what we're doing here is communicating what we expect. We expect the out, we expect normal. Our hypothesis is we're going to produce normal. So we're communicating what's expected. But essentially the answer to your question, Beth, is we've applied the foundations of job relations throughout. Um, question, the third question was from Christian Burns. <clears throat> and it's a great question. What's the main difference between Mr. Cato's approach and the standard work approaches delivered by Books and Sensei? I thought a lot about this. It's a bloody, it's an excellent, sorry. It's an excellent question. And the thing I really took away, when I came away from Japan, what I really felt was that I, um, what I really liked about it was rather than having a absolute specific recipe, it, 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 in, what he was communicating, what he spoke about was the, the principles and philosophies of standardization. So it's, and it seems, and the pattern we're using seems to be all encompassing. In other words, it bring, it's not saying part of continuous improvement or part of lean or whatever is standardization. Standardization is really the whole game, if you like, and it pulls in things like job relations, as I've mentioned, job instruction, the skill of leading, the skill of instructing, it pulls in the need to problem solve. <clears throat> so rather than being standardization being something you do as well as, standardization within this model is all encompassing and it's based on, it's dr driven, it drives philosophies and principles rather than a, a necessary set recipe. I mean, you're seeing a recipe for warm and estate, but the recipe we use in uh, a, a healthcare or disability care might be slightly different, but the principles and philosophies will be the same. The other thing that it did for me that was really, really helpful was I believe there's a lot of confusion out there and a lot of various interpretations of work standards, standard work, standardized work and standardization, those four terms. It was very clear on what a work standard is, what standard work is, what standardized work is, and what standardization is, four different things. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So what, that was one of the fundamental differences I mean, is it clearly communicated which of the four, uh, what each of the four are? And I was certainly one who was confused prior to this. So I trust that answers your question, Christian. I've got three more minutes. So Kevin, um, thanks for joining. I know you've done a lot of work in this area. How did the frontline, Kevin Little, how did frontline staff help make normal, uh, make abnormal easy to see? <clears throat> well, they made it easy to see because they had different interpretations of abnormal. So to start with, they made it easy to see because when you were having discussions with them, they made it, they, they all had different interpretations of abnormal, including these three supervisors, three, these three leaders, Peter, Josh, and Lisa, they had different interpretations of abnormal. Peter's worked on a bottling line for a long time. Peter and Lisa had a lot of discussions about what's normal for that screw cap um, and the knurling and various different elements of the screw cap. <clears throat> so it was interesting. Um, that's how they helped. And um, <clears throat> pardon me, really by having the debate. That's how they helped by having the debate. And then once um, once normal was established, nor, uh, through those bars that Josh set up, for example, with a red and the green, uh, he was able to make it very easy for operators to see abnormal. So Kevin, please email me if that doesn't if I didn't answer your question very well or didn't understand the question. Hey, Oscar. Shane, hi. Yes. We have a question. Yes. Um, how are new employees trained? Are they shown the work documents first or later after they have had hands-on training for a while? Yeah, great question. So they're shown the, uh, the, the, the truth at the moment is that they start their work and then within, uh, so when a person starts on the cask line, there's about six basic jobs they do. They're introduced to them uh, a year ago, they were introduced to them straight away and training was done three or four days later. I'd say now we're at the point where they're introduced to them straight away and training starts on that day. What we're moving them towards is that before that they get the training right at the start. So um, the reality of the world now is uh, the operator starts the work just through a buddy, and then training will start sometime that day. The formal training using job instruction breakdown 
and using these work standards. What, we're, what they're aiming to get to, and it's a mind shift, change, let's be, re let's be realistic, is that as soon as a person walks in, they get trained using the work standards and the job instruction breakdown. But, the, but the, this organisation is not at that point yet. Great question, Skylar, thanks. So Shane, you asked, and um, we're at 4.30, I'll put one more question. What is the CEO's role in making this happen? Good question, interesting one. We have a review with the CEO once a month about their progress through this and the CEO pays my bill. So that's his role. Um, but clearly, if things weren't moving forward through that review that we have once a month about their progress, then um, I doubt whether I'd, so he'd be paying my bill. So <clears throat> what I would like to finish with is where to from here. If you have questions, please email me, oscar at twiinstitute.com. But there is an opportunity. If you want to pick up uh, the philosophies and principles and start practicing what I've communicated yourselves, the opportunity comes from the workshop uh, titled Laying a Found Solid Foundation, Step Up One of the Five Step Ups Model. It's got four bullet points there that you'll, which are important, recognize the importance of Step Up One. We'll use a simulation in this room, live online, live online to, uh, for me to illustrate work standards. And, you'll, and I'll go further into um, the case study and a bit deeper into uh, a step up one via a case study. It's on July 27 and 28. There's a limit to 10 places. So I would really appreciate you joining us. So Skylar, thank you very much for the opportunity. I'll hand back to you. Thank you, Oscar. Thank you to everybody who participated in today's webinar. Also, you should go ahead and check out Oscar's workshop online at Lean Frontiers slash workshops. A reminder that today's webinar will be sent out as a recording. Please provide us 24 to 48 hours. And thank you to everybody who submitted your questions. Have a great day. Thanks everyone, bye.